say someone's just out of college and they're a little stressed, not sure kind of what the next steps are, what are some tools that they could do to just feel, feel better? Bree, welcome to the Bullet Wealth Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Scott. Thanks. How are you doing? Awesome. Thank you. I'm doing well. And I thought a good starting point would just be for you to share a little bit more about your background and then how you got into the position that you are now. Yeah. So uh, it's a it's a pretty lengthy story. I'll give you an abridged version and then we can go into details as you see fit. But um, I am a therapist by trade, went to school to become a counselor, worked in, in schools for a while as a school counselor. Um, And then, you know, I thought I had my career path already set on track, loved what I was doing, and life happens. So in March of 2020, I had a really, as the world was shutting down, so too was my body. I had a really rare medical condition that sort of uh, flipped my life on its head and essentially also thrust me into starting everything that I'm doing now. So That experience for me thrust me into starting my own podcast, starting my business. It's a mental wealth services business, Uh, becoming a public speaker, which has always been the ultimate dream for me to really get into motivation and sharing, uh, you know, insight into mental health and how I can help people get through uh, really difficult and trying situations. And then what happened to me? So uh, it all sort of fell into place. So out of really scary things in life comes uh, really major opportunities that we have to jump at. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely a good way to look at it. And and so what does the mental services business focus on? Yeah. Uh, so one of the, the primary focuses is emotional wellness. So there's several sort of components of that. It really depends on the individual or group that I'm working with. But the emotional wellness component is really helping people understand that our emotions and the things that we feel inside of us are not, one, um, they're not entirely out of our control as we can often feel like they are. And two, they're actually tools that we can use as indicators for a lot of uh, places and spaces in life. And we just need to be able to learn how to understand them and then tune into them to use them in a way that's going to serve us and really open up our, our future potential. And could you share some of those tools? Say someone's just out of college and they're a little stressed, not sure kind of what the next steps are. What are some tools that they could do to just feel, feel better? Yeah. So, um, I really like to, to break it down with definitions first. And I find that when we start to really understand what's taking place in our heads and, you know, sort of like our psychology between mind and body, then things start to make sense for us because we can start connecting the dots. So the first very, very basic level tool that I share is consciousness. And I share that because I'm going to sort of give you what that means and why it's so important. Um, the medical experience that I went through actually rendered me paralyzed for several weeks. Uh, Luckily, there was a cure. We found out what it was. I was able to sort of go through an intense process. And then I had to learn how to walk again. And what I had realized in that process was I had both literally and metaphorically been walking through life unconsciously. And it started with learning a simple process that I have been doing every day since I was uh, a tiny subconscious human being when I learned how to walk the first time. But I didn't really think about the process at that time. I just learned it. Maybe my parents saw the process happen, so that gave them a new perspective. But for me, I as I said, a subconscious human being, sort of where senses are happening at that age, but really not much else. I learned it and then I filed in the back of my head and I've been, I was walking for 28 years up until March of 2020. So that conscious process, I realized that for the 27 years that I was walking was entirely unconsciously. I had never thought about 
all of these steps, again, literally and, and metaphorically, that go into something that I've been doing every day. So this really got me into thinking about what other places and spaces in my life have I been walking through unconsciously. And that really opens the door. If you take, if we want sort of a deliverable tool, take 24 hours, 24 hours and journal everything that you do. And then after that 20, and, and I mean, you know, not just like hour to hour, but we're talking processes in the moment. So for me right now, speaking, you know, using my auditory ability, kind of thinking on the spot and having a conversation. Also, you know, using this technology that I take for granted. So really try to detail your processes in 24 hours. And how detailed do you go on that? Do you say, oh, I set up, I grabbed my phone or (laughs) how how detailed do you get with that? So um, I want, you can be as detailed as you want. The more detailed, the more insight. But I know that detailing a full day while also going about a full day can be tedious and complicated. So this could also be something that you detail at the end of the night if that's, you know, make it work for you and uh, your lifestyle. But I really want you to detail the processes that you use every day that you have not really given a second thought to. Um, And again, these go from everything from our our singular self processes. So thinking, talking, responding, walking, uh, making a meal, all of these things to processes that might be taking place at work, whether it's, you know, uh, you do auditing or you do, uh, you're a teacher or some, wherever you do, I just want you to take note of your processes. And then you're going to take a look at everything you've been doing unconsciously. This is just step one. This is just going to sort of, uh, shake you and wake you to how much you do on autopilot and where we can find spaces to sort of take moments, uh, mindfulness moments or moments where we really recognize that we are here in this moment. We don't get it back. So how Mm -hmm. else can I use this moment as I do an automated process, but how else might, might me appreciating this moment actually enhance the automation of the process? So there's a lot of things we can do once we figure out where those sort of automated life spaces are for you, but finding out where you're walking through life unconsciously is definitely step one in journaling in whatever capacity that you can. Awesome. I could definitely see that helping with gratitude, helping with maybe even finding areas that you might be wasting time on or Mm -hmm. spending times on things that you don't really value. So you could work on trying to eliminate those things. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really good tool. And then what's, what's kind of next, what's like the next step then, if that's step one. So uh, you know, this could, like I said, this could be a several step process. And this is a uh, sort of one path that I'm leading on of several tools that we could talk about several different iterations of processes that we could go through as well. But if we start with consciousness in that journaling phase of understanding our automated processes, uh, then it's understanding our mental spaces around these processes. So, um, you know, what we can do there is first understand where there are spaces that we can enhance ourselves personally in that day and where we can enhance ourselves professionally. And this is going to take a deeper dive into our mindset. So we're really going to go deep into once we identify the spaces that are just fully automated and and you realize you are not taking full advantage of, uh, we're going to figure out why. Why might this be uh, something that you just go through day to day monotonously, so to speak? And the way we're going to do that is through a few different um, mindset, uh, let's say mindset ingenuity, so to speak. So so it's going to be mindset shifting. It's about how we see ourselves in these positions and in these spaces in life. And if we're seeing ourselves in the way that we want to be seeing ourselves in these positions and in these spaces. So different tools like mindset work, reframing and deframing. So let's say you spend four hours going through uh 
emails, responses, and sort of just doing data collection in the morning, it might be necessary for your business, which is okay. But if this is taking up four hours of your day, uh, is it a is, is there space to condense that, to enhance it, to find moments for yourself that make it less monotonous? So it's, it's almost as if we're uh, moment to moment hacking in our lives to enhance how we go about our lives moment to moment. So again, that mindset shift, we find places where we can shift our mindset and this is also another journaling process that might take place separately where after we do this consciousness piece, we might also want to do a feelings journal. Uh, and then we can also mm -hmm. see patterns between the two, understanding how we feel about these processes day in and day out. If we want to change, if we're telling ourselves we can't change. So there's a lot of different ways that we can work through, but it's all going to start with understanding where we are oriented in our lives, both physically and psychologically. And when you're doing that journaling process and you're writing it down, is it pretty important to pick the correct like labels of how you're feeling instead of just saying happy or sad? <laughs> is it important to say, oh, go into more detail there? So this is where, uh, you know, there's definitely, it's okay to not label it correctly because this is sort of where uh, someone else is going to come in and help you label it correctly. So what, yeah. what I'm looking for when I work with clients is understanding um, exactly so, sort of, I want, I want to know what you're telling yourself in those moments. So it could just be like, okay, you know, I, I do my eels, me, emails in the morning and I feel blah. That's fine. That's something that I can work with, but we're going to pull apart. What does blah mean? Why is blah there? Is blah sort of something that we can't get rid of and it's a part of our day that we have to figure out, you know, how to incorporate and work with? Or is it something that you have, uh, you have the ability to iterate in a way that's going to yield a better feeling for you. And a lot of this comes down to limiting beliefs and fixed limitations. So often in our lives, we see our lives as fixed. We see ourselves in places, spaces, and positions that cannot be changed according to what's happening in our minds. And that's something just based on conditioned belief systems in our whole lives. So someone who says, this is what I do and this is unchanging, is someone who has probably been conditioned to think, feel, and do that thing for a very long time. The, the caveat there, I guess, is the fact that we get stuck in belief systems that actually can be changed and they actually can be changed to really enhance our emotional profiles that enhance everything else about our lives. So it's being able to pinpoint those spaces in our lives that are not, uh, that we feel like are unchanging or we're telling ourselves are unchanging and find ways that we can mold and iterate to make them better. And that seems like a tough thing to do to go from that fixed mindset to more of a growth mindset. Mm. Is there any really tidbits there for how we can get out of that fixed mindset where you might feel stuck, stuck in a certain way of doing things or whatever it might be? Absolutely. So there's kind of two pieces I want to touch on. First, I started really talking about beliefs. And I think that, like I said, educating on the psychological processes are just as important because you start to realize what's actually taking place there. So beliefs and our belief systems, uh, the way you can really think about it is, I don't know if there's anyone listening or even uh if you are a winter sports person, I actually am not, but if anyone just knows the mechanics of skiing, sledding, and snowboarding, you know that a fresh snow mound uh, is going to be great for 
going down the mountain. I'm talking from a sledding experience. So like I said, you don't need to be a professional. And if you've never done any of them, uh, a video is just fine. But what you know, what you notice, excuse me, is that when you go down that fresh snow for the first time, that sled, snowboard, or ski is going to make an imprint. The more times you follow that same path down the mountain, let's say I go down in my sled several times, that imprint in that snow is going to get packed down harder and harder into the mountain, making more of an impression into the mountain. This is actually how we build beliefs in our heads, in our minds, A belief is a thought or experience patterned over and over again, often at earlier stages in our life that we have thought or felt so many times that it becomes truth to us. Uh, And for many people, you know, belief, strong beliefs, especially, you know, when, when I think of belief, I think the strongest belief that I've seen in human beings is uh, a spirituality or religious beliefs, which I, which can be beautiful. And that is again, us hearing these patterns of what is real and what is true for so long that it becomes a part of us, which is amazing, but not all beliefs serve us. So as A man, if you were told men don't cry over and over and over, or you have to be tough or, you know, use your thick skin, all of these sort of conditioned pieces around men and emotions when you were younger, that belief becomes you, you have thick skin. You will not cry. You will not show your vulnerability. So it patterns inside of you and becomes a part of who you are. What I'm saying is it's not that beliefs aren't true, especially to us. It's that they can change. We just need to, it's almost as if we need to wait for that fresh snow to come. And that fresh snow is a new perspective, a new understanding that you can start to think over and over again. And that brings me to the second point, which is about self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is the idea or the belief in yourself that you have the ability or capability to do anything or do said task X, Y, and Z without ever having actually done it before. So often our beliefs about ourselves, oh, please. And you're saying, you said you have to be able to believe that you can do that, So th- that you can do something that you haven't done before? Yes. Yeah, so this is actually, it's called self-efficacy and it's a tool that, we, or a skill, so to speak, think of like a mindset skill that we can practice. And it's the same way as patterning a belief into our minds from when we were younger. Self-efficacy is another belief that we can do something or we will do something or complete something that we might have never done. So this is based on a combination of skills, experience, watching others do it, getting uh, positive feedback. There's a lot of things that play into our personal self-efficacy. Think of it on a scale from one to a hundred. So someone who's got a hundred percent self-efficacy, uh, you know, thinks or knows that they can do anything in the world, which could be great. I don't think that all of us, I would say often a lot of us sort of teeter on the 50-50 scale where we think we can do some things, but yeah. we don't think we can do others. And the self-efficacy tool is something that we practice uh, as we move through life with smaller incremental moments. So if you are thinking that you can't do any other skill, for me as a therapist, I'm a trained therapist. It's what I can do. Uh, I, I can't do other things because this is just what I've known my whole life is being a therapist and an educator. And that's what I've been groomed to do. That's what I know. If that is my mindset right now, that's okay. But building self-efficacy is building on the other skills that could put me in the position to do something else. So it's a slow and steady incremental process that we use to repattern our belief systems in order to sort of change trajectory. I love that. That's good. And what's kind of the last last takeaway we should leave our listeners with? Mm, so, 
self-efficacy is kind of what I, I work with constantly. And that is a big part of my expertise, so to speak. And my whole my whole belief system, especially within my business, is to buy into the possibility of you. And that is, it's almost the precursor to self-efficacy. If you don't yet have the tools to believe that you can, I want you to understand that somewhere outside of your realm of vision, so somewhere uh, even outside of your peripheral vision, is your future possibility. And just because you can't see it in front of you does not mean it doesn't linger in the wait. So to buy into the possibility of you is to buy into the fact that you don't know what you don't know, point blank, period. And we are learning about ourselves every day. So to understand that we have possibility and potential outside of our realm of vision is really the first step in becoming the next version or the 2.0 version of yourself. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> and thank, thank you again so much for coming on today sure. and sharing some of this with our, with our audience. And, and where can people, where can people find you? Yeah. So, uh, I, again, mm -hmm. thank you for having me. I really appreciate the space and the ability to share, uh, some of these pieces with you. If anyone is looking, um, for me to work with me or have me come speak, uh, that is something that I'm doing very regularly. And is a big part of the business right now. You can find me at brieundeniably.com and any social profile profile at Brie underscore undeniably. It's B-R-I-U-N-D-E-N-I-A-B-L-Y. Thank you.